Now, yeah. Okay, uh, let's get started, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Spine Conference. Uh, today's uh, discussion will be quadriquina syndrome. So, um, um, we have a um, good morning, Dr. Sexton. Uh, I'm good. So, uh, I like to uh, do um, go over a case. Uh, they're all real cases that I've taken care of. 39-year-old woman uh, who, was, who came into the office, in the elective office, uh, with a chief complaint of bilateral sciatica, and she had a chief complaint of perineal anesthesia. Um, she had two weeks of symptoms. Th this was June 2017. And um, she did not seek medical attention because she thought it was multiple sclerosis. So these patients, uh, she's actually a young woman. But these patients, uh, multiple sclerosis patients, they get these patchy weaknesses and numbness. So she just figured the perineal numbness was just her MS kicking in for some unusual reason. Um, she also has a history of bipolar disease, gastric sleeve uh, repair, uh, where she lost weight but then put it back on. Uh, she's on disability. She lives alone. Um, does anybody? Her exam was she had no motor deficits in her lower extremities. Morning, yeah. Messman. And 39-year-old um, woman with bilateral sciatica, perineal anesthesia, uh, reported to my office. No motor sensory deficits in her ankles. Her, her on exam, she had a positive straight leg raise on the left, uh, and very minimal right side symptoms. So, um, any questions about the presentation so far? And she had perineal anesthesia. She had, she she told me she had perineal anesthesia, which is unusual, because most patients don't tell you that. Uh, but, uh, you know, she was just, just telling me everything she felt. She thought it wasn't uh, important, but she did tell me. So any questions about the exam or history? Okay, so uh, let's start with the x-ray. So she has an x-ray. And um, uh, Dr. Carlton, what are your thoughts about the x-ray? These are always standing views. Well, you say she's young. Yeah, she's got some minimal changes of the kind of just to be normal alignment of lack of regulation. Okay, uh, so uh, just decrease, and uh, in my simplified world, I would just say decrease disc height at five one. That's about that's about it. No scoliosis. So um, how about we alternate back and forth because Dr. Samir is here, and I don't want to think that he's uh, less a part of the team. He's a very nice man. Good morning, Paul. This is a um, thirty nine year old woman uh, with bilateral sciatica and perineal numbness, uh, two weeks of symptoms. She actually, she, I forgot to tell you guys, she went to the emergency room and did it, they did an excellent job in the emergency room. They got an emergency MRI and she was told to see a doctor the next morning. Actually, I think they called me and she did not want to stay in the hospital. Uh, she has mental illness. She has um, bipolar disease. She lives alone and um, I don't, she didn't follow the instructions of the emergency room physicians. The physician said, okay, if you see the surgeon next day, that should be fine. But she didn't. Um, so, so she had an emergency MRI in the um, emergency room. Space occupying region at the level. I'm assuming this is L5 S1 level. We'll call it 5 1. Yeah, L5 S1. A slightly uh, hyper intense relative to the dried or desiccated disc. The L5 S1 disc. So this could be a large disc extrusion. Yeah. Um, and it's a blurry image. You didn't say anything, but uh, she had difficulty in the scanner. And I had I have found that people with serious problems cannot stay still in the scanner because, by definition, they have either severe pain or uh, they're scared or it's it's very difficult to get a good MRI sometimes. So as a surgeon, uh, it's difficult because you have to deal with suboptimal imaging because you want the best imaging that you can get. But I think it's part of the, uh, don't you think, Paul, it's kind of part of the job is you have to deal with this sometimes. Okay. Um, so, uh, at, at the L3, L4, and L4, L5 level, you can see a normal adhering uh, space in the central canal. You can see the people sack with the product while I know who's coming in the recess. Um, so I'm not concerned about these two levels. Uh, they look quite normal. Okay. How about at 5-1? So I found one, um, again, fat is our friend, so on the right side you would see the normal hyperintense fat <laughs> in the lateral recess, but on the left side it's obviously asymmetric where you're you're lacking that normal fat. This is the T2-weighted image too. Yeah, it's, 
so far. Uh, 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 flat shit is still bright on T2. Mm -hmm. uh, T1 is easier to see, um, but you know, I would say just looking at this image, um, you know, this would correlate to the lesion we saw on the lateral. So, so it looks it looks like it goes with like this large one. disc extrusion. Very large yeah. L5 S1. So I took the liberty of um, drawing out the spinal canal, and um, I want to ask um, Ocean, where's the spinal fluid? Where'd it go at L5 S1? I come we don't see it, but you <clears throat> see it all here. So it could either have been translated superiorly or superiorly. So yeah, there's, you can't see it because it's huge distance. Yeah. So you don't see any spinal fluid. And so this is this is this is not that patient, but this is what I felt was a. How would you describe like Carlton? How would you describe this? this is a tiny disc herniation, a normal disc herniation, a big one, or? Well, we um, talk about qualitative and quantitative descriptions in here, uh, and uh, more or less where the uh, standard practice is uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. So I have mild, moderate, and severe, which is uh, a bit arbitrary. I would call this a moderate disc herniation. Moderate. So how would you call this one? So uh, I would say this one, you call the surgeon and say, hey, do you know about this guy? Uh, this one follow up in the office. Okay, so I, I want to ask um, uh, Kate, th this is a weight in my um, in my basement. And what, what happened here? I lifted it up and pulled it. What happened here? Huh. What is that? It looks like it left an imprint on... It did, didn't it? Yeah, on the mat that it was left on. Why did it leave an imprint? Because it was pressing on for so long, and um, basically the, the surface deformed. Yeah. What is that called in orthopedics? There's a word for that. Uh, for slow deformation... Plastic deformation. And, and uh, is there another word, maybe? Elastic like deformation. Creep? Like creep. creep. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's pressure. Now, I want to ask... Um, someone smart like David, why doesn't this patient have a complete neurological deficit? Why aren't her ankles like totally motored out? Why? Yeah. So it probably, I think it probably was a slow process, right? Otherwise she would have more symptoms. Uh, just like this weight. It was just a very slow pressure in the spinal canal, the disc slowly. Do you agree with that, Paul? Probably. And that's why the symptoms are not so dramatic. You know, she does have sciatic, but she's walking around. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so the neurological compression does not correspond to the patient's symptoms sometimes. And I think it's just a matter of time. Like they, they had the ability to... Uh, basically um, adapt to that problem. So um, do you want to add anything else, um, Les Fenn, to this? Okay. Okay. So uh, is, so what's a cauda, what's a cauda equina? What is a cauda equina? What does that mean in Latin? Grant? Horse tail? And it kind of looks like a horse's tail, doesn't it? The cauda equina, the nerve roots in the lumbar spine. If you removed all the dura, it does kind of look like it. So the anatomist described it. And who can tell me what cauda equina syndrome is? What, what's a syndrome? Does everybody know the definition of syndrome? It's a collection. I use the word constellation like a, or collection, constellation of signs and symptoms, right? So, um, Megan, what's a, what's a cauda equina syndrome? What is, the, what is it? Tell me the three things. Oh, you get pain, you can get saddle anesthesia, and then how long you get sacral nerve root dysfunction where you get lateral bowel dysfunction. Yeah. It sounds like most people would classify cauda equina as having having to have bladder dysfunction to say that you have cauda equina, but it sounded like from the articles we read that it was actually not firm. That, that's a firm belief. From yeah, everyone. that's why I call it sacral nerve root dysfunction, because you have to have a very open mind and you have to be extremely suspicious. So my question is, can Samir tell us that it's a cauda equina syndrome? Can he call you and say, hey, uh, Megan, I have a cauda equina syndrome here? No, right? It's not a radiographic diagnosis. But they can say there's compression of the cauda equina, which puts a patient at risk for cauda equina syndrome. 
Okay, so it's, so I call it sacral nerve root dysfunction because uh, it can be it can present in very variable ways and it can be like very prosaic. So I just um I just put this uh, the homunculus that we remember from medical school because uh, not to be weird, but the genital area is very serious because if you don't have sensation to your genital area. You, you don't enjoy having sex, which is, I mean, it's funny and everybody jokes around, but it's a serious problem. And uh, if you lose the sensation to your general area, which is richly innervated, because as part of our being a human being, we have to propagate the species, uh, it's very important to have uh, general sensation. And if you lose a general sensation, it's a serious problem. So my, so I have a question to, um, to Grant, do people go around talking about their perineal sensation like like all the time? Do people come up to you and talk to you about it? No. Never, right? No one's going to come up to you and say, my penis is numb or my vagina is numb. So what do you have to do as a doctor? What's your responsibility for these people? You have to make sure explicitly say, are you having... You have to ask. Yeah. You have to ask. And, and no one's going to come up. So I know... In, I have a couple anecdotes is that some, some women, I, I ask them, some women, they don't tell me. Because you know we're opposite sexes, and uh, and and the I had at least three or four cases in my career where a woman said, "Yeah, half of my vaginal area is numb." They didn't say anything unless I asked them, and that to me is like serious, serious problem. And they're not gonna they're not gonna offer that to you. So and you're a little comfortable, but you have to realize it's your. You do agree with that, Paul? It's like they're very reluctant to say anything, but you have to ask. So, um, so what is sandal anesthesia? What's the area for sandal anesthesia, Graham? So, uh, the way I tell patients, if you paint a saddle and sit on it, where is the paint? Do you have any numbness in that area? Say if you sat on it, and people like, I'm in Hartford County, so people understand that completely, understand saddles. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Paul's a Harford County person. I forgot. English or Western? I'd say English. The English stuff. That's what you're going to see here. First, the, 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 the West are the ones that be home on the front. Okay. So if you're out West, they'll show you the saddle and they're showing you. That's English. Okay. Okay, so um, who can tell me, how do you quantitatively measure the motor strength of sacral nerve roots S2 to S5? Can you? Is it easy? Can you do it? It's not a trick question. Like, is it easy? To, like, can you, like, like if I grabbed Ocean's arm to chest C, C5, it's pretty easy, right? He pushes on his deltoid, his elbow. How can you measure sacral function? Difficult, right? There's no, like, sacral nerve in the leg or something, uh, S2 to S5. So you can say euro, uh, eurodynamics, but th that's uh, difficult to do, especially in the emergency room. Okay, so Grant's going to take over now for um, digital rectal exam, which is part of uh, cardiac crime syndrome, and how does the anus work? And how do you do a rectal exam, a proper one? For neurological, for neurological, not for prostate, but neurological. Uh, this is the intro to the um, arm volume symptom. Um, this is just the anatomy of your internal and external sphincters of the anus. So the control sphincter is just the um, machine with the circular smooth muscle of the rectum. Um, it's involuntary and contracted during rest. It relaxes during defecation when you have... Um, Distension of the rectal ampullae, so when you have stool coming. The internal one. The internal one. Uh -huh. um, the inner sphincter space is just a small glandular area between the internal and exterior sphincter. And then your external sphincter um, is made of voluntary shared muscles. It's divided into three layers that function as one unit. Typically, your external sphincter, um, I'm not sure if the next slide gets into this, gives you about 30% of your rectal tone. And then the um, internal and inner sphincter space give you the rest of the rectal tone. So I don't know that I assume this. Before I read this, that your external sphincter gave the majority, but it's actually not true. The internal and sphincter space gives the majority of your rectal. So why are these two important? Like this, just think about it as like now, just from ten thousand feet. Why are these two sphincters important? Um, your external sphincter. So say you're telling it, saying it to your ten-year-old child. How so, describe it? So your the inside one and the outside one. Outside one is going to be the outside one is important because it's voluntary. That's how you retain um, stool. If you're having the urge to go and say you're... Right. So if your child goes, Dad, I got to go, the external sphincter fired, mm -hmm. and your child knows, oh, I got to go, number two, Dad. And if without that, it's a big deal because 
you just go to the bathroom on yourself when you have to go. So it's important to have the external sphincter, mm-hmm. right? And how about the internal sphincter? Internal sphincter, um, if you don't have that chronic tone, you will have no um, control of the feces reaching the external sphincter. And because it's external sphincter, it can be fatigued that you eventually, when you have um, continuous of stool continually backing up onto the external sphincter, you're going to fatigue that muscle and you're going to have incontinence. Right. So then you, if you don't have that, what are you going to tell your child what would happen? Let's say magically you have no internal sphincter. Mm-hmm. What would what would that child be constantly telling you? Yeah, I, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. It, yeah, it'd drive you crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a funny and a joke, but it's serious because if you have that problem, it's no joke. Mm-hmm. And and the reason why I'm saying this is you should do a good rectal exam if you're a good if you're a good student of spine. Mm-hmm. Katie's going to tell us how to do a good one. Um, so, good rectal exam. For rect- like, neurological. For neurological. Yeah. I mean, it's different. Like, for other, for, like, general surgery, you just check for heme. Right. And for internal medicine, you look at the prostate for a man. But neurological is different. So, how does a neurological uh, so exam? So, obviously, what you do is you let the patient know what you're doing uh, step by step. What you do. It's important. It is. No, she's right. So, you let the patient know what you're doing as you're doing it. Um, first, you check perirectal sensation. Um, then you insert one finger. Um and you check the external sphincter, um, have them voluntarily try to contract it, and then squeeze insert, on it. Tell them to squeeze on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then a little, for, and then insert a little further and check just the um, involuntary tone of the internal sphincter. Right, and you got to check both because you want to know are both working, mm-hmm. and the sensation. Yeah, and where, where do you point? Where do you point your finger? You just oh, yeah. All right, good job. So, does anybody want to add anything to that? Uh, point to the so belly button. Point to the belly button when you do the exam. When you just j- jam it in there blind, you know, you just got You have to aim it so it doesn't hurt. Um, so you can do um, just with with your finger, or you can do um, an anal wink reflex. Um, so you can take a not super sharp, but a sharper object and uh, and touch the area and see if they have a contraction of their uh, external sphincter. I would probably go for a um, uh, the opposite end of a cotton tip applicator. I think that's reasonably sharp enough without being too sharp. Yeah, yeah in the emergency, this, you're probably in the emergency room in the office, you can just take a little needle, I would think, just for a sharp pinprick. Or a, a, a filling needle would be okay, the like blunter. And the cotton tip is almost too dull even on the wood handle. Okay. That probably just break it. That's it gives it. Not as sharp as a needle, but not as dull as a long tongue piece of wood. Okay. Broken tongue depressor, same way. Okay. Okay. Everybody want to add anything to that? Um, okay. So keep going, Grant. Anything else to add to this? Um, kind of what I repeated. Uh, as I before, this is kind of what I before, how the external anal sphincter they would see will. So if you don't have internal anal sphincter function, um, eventually, you're going to have frequent small bowel movements over and over again because of the continual really the external sphincter. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the article I presented is titled Evaluation of Digital Rectal Examination for Assessment of Anal Tone and Suspected Colloquine Syndrome, published in 2014 out of the UK. So the aim of this study was to establish uh, the use of DRE for assessment of anal tone. Um, so they took... <clears throat> 75 doctors of all specialties, it was biased towards ER doctors as well as surgeons, and compared them to 30 hospital care assistants. Um, and these assistants had no training in the um, performance of a DRE and will never use it in their practice. And they um, assessed the ability of these um, individuals to assess proper rectal tone, and they also compared their results with the individual clinician experience, prior educational experience that they meet, as well as that individual self-confidence in their own ability to do a DRE. So for this, um, they used a model anus and they used a modified pediatric swing and a monitor cuff to access the sphincter. Um, for, their, um, for their baseline rectal tone, they used 60 millimeters of mercury. For a reduced rectal tone, they used 35 millimeters of mercury. And then for a anal um, Squeeze test, they use 180 millimeters of mercury. Um, all participants did four exams um, and all were randomized as to whether it was reduced, um, standard, or a uh, length test. Does everybody understand that? It's interesting. 
So the, the, the anus has a range from zero millimeters of mercury to 180 is the most. So some people have tighter sphincters than others. <laughs> and um, 60 was the average. Yes, I didn't get into this. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's an interesting it's model. Stuff, 60 yeah, millimeters. actually made a standardized range for anal this, this is the this is from gastroenterology, you know, mm -hmm. research and people who do this work where people have problems. Yeah, they use it's interesting. To measure it yeah. Measure so you're sticking a finger in a model that has a blood pressure cuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so for the accuracy, they found no difference in performance between doctors and the control group of medical assistants. Um, both were correct in 64% of cases. Um, on the first attempt, 60% of doctors of all specialties were able to correctly identify the tone. Um, and it does not increase with success, uh, successive attempts. Um, in terms of training, they found, again, no difference in uh, either training or no training, as well as some training, moderate training, and extensive training in DRV. There was no difference made whether you were able to successfully um, measure anal tone. Also, they asked these doctors how confident you use that anal tone, how often you perform DREs in your clinical practice, how much experience do you feel that you had in performing DREs, um, how much importance do you place in them, and then how accurate do you think anal tone could be assessed during DRE. They asked all the doctors these questions, and they found that no matter what their response was, it did not um, predict whether they would be actually accurate in assessing medical tone. So for a doctor's first attempt, uh, the yield sensitivity of only 46.5%. Um, um, this indicates that the finding says that DRE is more successful in ruling out a reduction in anal rather than diagnosing it. Um, it did have a high specificity, like I said, at 75%. Um, however, the, first, the true positive rate of a doctor's first attempt was only 27%. So on your first attempt in the ER, which most of us, that's the, that's the um, setting which you're doing it, your chance of being, hey, I believe this is reduced rectal tone, and actually being reduced rectal tone was only 25%. Um, they compared it to the, the accuracy of a doctor's first attempt was not statistically significantly better than a 50-50 coin flip um, for a test of only two outcomes. The one thing I did find interesting is that all of when they um, looked at these medical assistants first physicians, every single person was able to successfully identify a squeeze test. So we're comparing normal rectal tone and reduced rectal tone versus having someone bear down and squeeze their anus. They could, every single person, training or no training, could detect that, which I thought was very interesting, which shows that we should definitely, every single test, be having people bear down, squeeze, and do an anal squeeze test. As far as your normal rectal exam, squeeze on my finger. Yeah. So, okay, so what is your summary? Are rectal exams worth worthwhile? I think only if you're doing a squeeze test. If not, then, I mean, the study shows that it's basically just a flip of a coin, especially in an isolated, you're not doing serial rectal exam, as you're mm -hmm. most likely, where you're seeing the ED. So motor, for motor function, but sensation is super important, mm -hmm. right? So sensation is a very good test. Yeah. So you got to do the rectal exam, definitely for sensation, but the motor doesn't work so well, but the squeeze test does. Yeah. So I think that was an important article. Don't you think, uh, guys, anybody? Okay, so Andrew, can you uh, just, uh, briefly go over a um, review of medical legal cases for quadriplegia syndrome? Absolutely. So this is a, an interesting paper. Uh, I think uh, it, it's significantly limited by its uh, scope and what they were able to find. It's sort of, right up, it's sort of summarized up on the slide for us, but they reviewed a Lexis Nexus academic search database. They go on to say that that's sort of the standard for searching legal cases. They found 104 lawsuits, of which only 15 qualified, which they highlighted as their first. Uh, limitation. Most of the limit, most of the uh, exclusions were due to uh, papers that weren't or lawsuits that weren't exclusively related to quadriplegia or involved disability or had some concern for some secondary gain from this. Uh, and they just sort of did a, a, a data mining study and looked at all the factors in these cases and what out and what was their outcome. Uh, the major things that they looked at 
included age, sex, uh, site of initial presentation, initial diagnosis, in other words, whether, whether or not catechina was identified immediately, whether or not a rectal was performed at all, did they consult a specialist and what kind of specialist it was, including orthopedics versus neurosurgery, uh, finally, what was their time to surgery, and then whether or not it was ortho or neuro who uh, was uh, consulted, and that's what's blocked down in the corner. Um, but of all of those variables, they only found two to be significant. Number one, in, in determining whether or not a plaintiff or a defendant was the one this lawsuit. Uh, number one was time to surgery. Greater than 48 hours delay between diagnosis and surgery led to a uh, more likely outcome for the plaintiff instead of the defendant. And uh, the second one was, uh, they called it an adverse decision. Uh, I don't exactly know what that means. But more importantly, they, I find that the ortho versus neurosurgery, the data that's blocked down in the corner, doesn't quite make a lot of sense to me. Because if you actually tally it up from the full chart in their case, they say that 80% uh, of the consults to orthopedics ended in a defense for the plaintiff, and 70% of the consults to neurosurgery ended in defense in, in a verdict for the defendant and then found that not significantly significant, which I find interesting. In other words, if an orthopedic surgeon was consulted 80% of the time we lost, the neurosurgeon was consulted 70% <laughs> of the time they won. So I don't quite understand that, but they highlighted that as Whoa. not significantly. So, so we got our uh, work cut out for us if we're orthopedic surgeons. Uh, also, delays to the OR for plaintiff verdicts were on average five days, whereas defendant verdicts were less than two. So uh, it should not take us five days to get into the OR. And if those variables are correlated, that if the orthopedic surgeons are taking five days to get to the OR and the neurosurgeons are taking two, then we could probably do better. Yeah, also 14, you uh, didn't say this, but 14 out of these 15 cases had no rectal exam documented. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Can, so I, need, can I just jump in yeah. here for a moment um, and observe? This is the radiologist's perspective. This is a really important topic. And uh, I think. Everybody knows in the room um, that uh, MRI is um, overused uh, in the spinal uh, survey for cord compression, uh, and there are several important components to why it is. Uh, this is perhaps the biggest component, and uh, in the MedStar system, years ago now, there was a very adverse reaction to a delayed diagnosis of cord compression. And as a result, um, the uh, EDs have been alerted and monitored uh, that they have a very low threshold for ordering an MRI spine survey because the downside is so steep. Uh, and, that, and, and so I think that is really the reason that this is going on. And another important component, though, is that um, there are these red flags and the pseudo red flags. So this morning we're talking about real red flags. And uh, this is really important stuff because uh, there is a, a big downside, whether it's legal or not legal. There's a uh, like about the perineal anesthesia and all, all sorts of other things. So getting this right is important. Um, and I think one of the blocks to uh, separating the wheat from the chaff is what you all are are learning or or you know in here, which is how to take a good history how to do a great physical exam, put patients in high likelihood and low likelihood of compression. The, the low likelihood ones can get a scan, but it doesn't have to be as an emergency in my opinion. Uh, the high likelihood, of course, you know, this bears it up both legally and ethically, is to go ahead and move, get the scan, you, you all make your decision about, your decision about surgery. But we're left, uh, in our edge of uh, things in imaging, of a pile of spine surveys for patients who have leg weakness, who have, oh yeah, my bowel and bladder don't work right. Uh, and um, so we have a, a huge number of, of uh, true negatives. Uh, the, the time when we get an actual acute cord compression is 5%, less than 5%. And these patients go on the MRI scan at all times of day and night, uh, and it's for a lot of these patients, not so much because they're in pain, but because they don't know where they are or what's going on. They're thrashing around, and our techs are coming in at night. And, we, uh, and so uh, this is a big problem for us. Uh, I think it's also a significant problem for you and that you want to get it right. And the other issue, too, if I might may add, uh, that some of these patients, you do find some unrelated pathology in the spine, and then they end up imaging further. So what happens with core compression 
it takes about 20 minutes, and there's too large field, field of view to cover the whole spine. So in order for us to see better pathology in the cervical spine, we would have to bring the patient back and do a dedicated field of view for the cervical spine. So that additional time. It's the more imaging. Yeah. I think you're talking about lumbar pathology versus a patient comes in who may have cord compression. I mean, those are two separate entities. But the, the ER does stack, compor- the ER does stack cord compression. Yeah, they right. They differentiate that. Right. So I'm saying, but. I still think that I understand that the the inconvenience of getting this there's a lot of false negatives, but that this this is clearly one of the most common medical legal cases that I review, and it's always delay of diagnosis. Okay, and and that and you know and there's always there's this there's this impetus to try to give doctors earlier warning signs and make it standard of care that if you miss an early warning sign before you get true quadriquina, that the the plaintiffs are always saying that that should have been diagnosed. But it's 48 hours, and and you said a comment earlier about sacral dysfunction. The definition which legally stands up is any signs of valve or bladder dysfunction, okay? Now, there's quadriquina incomplete, they call now, and it's now quadriquina. At suspected. risk. We're going to go over that. Right, New York. But, but I'm saying that this 48 hours comes from this one article you're going to come up From with. the onset of symptoms. Yes, from the onset of bladder or bowel dysfunction. Right. So they don't and come They don't come uh, time point zero. So they're usually time point 24 hours, usually. You know? Patients don't present to you at the time point zero, so you have very limited time to make a diagnosis. on what the patient tells you, but I'm saying it's the 48-hour window is key, as you mentioned here, so it's delayed diagnosis is the number one reason for lawsuits. Absolutely, and it is what's important because patients will come 24 hours in, so if you operate two days later, that counts as three days according to a plaintiff's lawyer. They're there that month. It's like a stroke. It's like TPA for strokes in the time of the same time. This is the neurosurgeon talking, so, it's, so she's really going to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> no, be defended. Well, it's easier to defend. It starts to the whole court compression, and I hear you. But I, I, serving on this court compression team, about one or two times a month, there is a case where there is a delayed diagnosis in the system and a bad outcome. And so as long as we keep having those cases consistently, I think ER doctors are going to be very quick to pull the trigger on court compression MRIs, unfortunately. Because once these patients get to the floor, not at Union, at Union, you guys are great to get the MRI down soon, um, but at other hospitals within MedStar, it can take two to three days to get an MRI or a myelogram or, you know, whatever. It just, there's not a sense of urgency on a medical team necessarily. So they, those hospitals really feel you've got to get that core compression MRI sorted out and you can all make a decision. Okay, so uh, I want to go over some bladder, uh, got to go to the bathroom, bladder um, signs and symptoms. Um, uh, I, in my career, I mean, people don't present and say, I have a doctor, I have a quadriquina syndrome. But I have had uh, three women tell me that when they urinate, the urine goes down their thigh, which I've never heard of before, but I've seen it three times. Now, uh, obviously, it's not normal. And I know what, the, what it is, I don't know what it is. But um, what, what else do men, uh, sometimes women, but mostly men say when they have urinary retention? What is it? Do you, does anybody know? How does it present? Huh? Is it initiation there? Yeah. So they, well, they frequently say, I can't, I can't feel uh, that I have to go to the bathroom, you know? So, and then they just have, so they have urgency. Um, and then also um, the stream. So uh, for men... The stream when you're young is like, you know, you can pee like three or four feet. You have contests when you're drinking. But um, the stream is very uh, uh, slow. And basically, and they just say, it doesn't, I don't even have a stream. Like you have to ask them. It just dribbles out, right? And what is that? When men say, I, when I pee, it just barely dribbles out. What does that mean? Yeah, you have no contraction of your bladder. So basically the bladder is, is like a huge ball and it just, just it, the sphincter just gives out and it comes out. Now that, some old men get that who have BPH um, too. So that's that's the issue. But 
So that that's so people don't present normally. So you have to, as a physician, you have to ask these questions and kind of understand it. Um, okay. And um, I won't get into this, but there's sympathetic, parasympathetic, and there's a voluntary, and very similar to the anal sphincter, we have involuntary and voluntary uh, innervations to the bladder. And then sexual dysfunction, uh, obviously for both men and women, decreased sensation is a serious problem when you're having sex if you cannot feel it. Uh, and the other thing that women get, uh, they can also get urinary incontinence during sex, which is a you know, huge problem too socially. Uh, and these uh, symptoms are worse with age. So just like everything, sex gets worse with age. So uh, who um, was going to present this? Wasn't it? Um, yeah, Kate. Okay. <laughs> so this is our thought presenting um, Cauda Aquatic Syndrome, secondary to lumbar disc herniation. So this is out of spine in uh, 2000. So it's, a, it's basically a meta-analysis pooling. First, who are those two guys on the screen? Anybody know who they are? Who are they? The Ahn Brothers. The Ahn Brothers, yeah. But you like the Ahn Brothers, right? They're good guys. Yeah, they're good guys. All right. <laughs> they were Hopkins residents when we were residents. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a meta-analysis pooling 322 patients. Uh, there's four, 42 different articles. Um, most of these I were noted to have a traumatic and sudden onset of um, cardiovascular syndrome, so not necessarily the creep that we um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so this looked at uh, different preoperative variables and the effect on specific postoperative outcomes, which are recovery of bowel function, urinary incontinence, um, weakness, numbness, and uh, or recovery of strength and sensation and um, recovery of sexual function. They also sought to um, kind of look at a larger pool of patients than previously studied to um, uh, correlate time to decompression um, to clinical outcomes. They initially had a whole bunch of different groups of time outcomes, less than 24 hours, 24 to 48, 2 to 10 days, um, 11 days to a month, and greater than a month. Um, ultimately, this was streamlined to um, greater than 48 hours and less than 48 hours for the time point. Um, so outcomes that they found, um, preoperative chronic low back pain um, predicted poor outcomes of restoration of uh, bladder and bowel function um, or uh, incontinence. Um, older patients tended to have a, uh, a uh, it tended to be predictive of having a 2.6 time risk of lack of return of sexual function. Um, as far as time to decompression, um, so there wasn't any difference in the three groups that were greater than 48 hours that, were, that was statistically significant. Um, so they condensed greater than 48 hours into one group. The same was true for less than 48 hours. So there was no real difference between less than 24 versus 24 to 48 hours. So they lumped that into another group. Um, ultimately, they were able to show that um, less than 48 hours of surgery showed significant improvement for restoration of sensory deficit motor deficit, um, urinary incontinence, and, uh, and uh, rectal dysfunction. So I think that this, this, is a, this article helps us a lot about um, not only counseling patients of what they can expect to, to recover um, based on having chronic low back pain um, versus not, and then I think it helps us guide time to decompression. So within 48 hours, kind of what was iterated in the past study that we talked about. Um, that's really our goal for treatment of cauda equina and decompression. Yeah, good job. And there's one thing I just want to add is when Costwick showed this at Grand Rounds at, Hos at Hopkins in 2000, I stood up and I said, have you ever seen a cauda equina syndrome with normal perineal sensation? He said, I don't think, no. Remember, he, uh, they didn't they didn't comment on that, but I remember I remember uh, I asked that question. The other interesting thing about the analysis was that a good percentage of patients, or even like twenty five percent, presented with unilateral radiculopathy and cortical It wasn't bilateral in the other case, so you get cortical or with unilateral radiculopathy. Okay, that, that was a good job. So um, I'm going to go quickly over this. What what is this? Who knows what this is? It's a chordoma, right? And um, a chordoma is a great way to experiment, experiment on humans. What do you need to have normal bladder control? So basically, the, I won't get into the details, but the basic premise is S3 nerve roots are the most important ones, S3, S4. 
uh, nerve roots um, are the most important ones for bladder function. And if you just preserve one S3 root, you do have a chance of having a normal bowel and bladder function. So, it, so it, it's it's interesting. Okay. So next up the bat is um, David with a standards of care in quadriquina syndrome, 2017 from the UK. Uh, Nicholas Todd's article. Yeah, so this is actually a literature review from Brochure on the Surgery in 2016. Didn't um, have any sort of findings of their own. They just have some uh, some recommendations based on that uh, large literature review. They went over 158 papers uh, after sort of weeding out uh, less relevant uh, information, 10 animal studies, and 60 human studies. Uh, one of the things they kind of went over was that there's no true standardized criteria or diagnosis of uh, quadriquina. Uh, the five characteristic features that they identified in all the papers include bilateral neurogenic sciatica, decreased perineal sensation, altered bladder function, and painless urinary retention, as well as loss of anal tone and sexual dysfunction. Um, based on their literature review, what they found was there's poor sensitivity and specificity for clinical exam um, and that positive MRI findings only correlated between 40 and 33 percent of the time in a positive clinical exam, uh, and only 47 percent of the time did that result in an emergency surgery. Um, MRI urgency, uh, they said, has not been determined for any of these uh, of these studies. Um, they went over the uh, different types of cauda equina syndrome, of which there are three, and they added the fourth two. Uh, there is CE, uh, CES, is the abbreviation, so CES complete. CES suspicious, uh, which is when there's bilateral radiculopathy, CESI, which is incomplete, which means there's uro urinary difficulties of neurologic origin, and then the fourth sub subtype was CESR, which is urinary retention and overflow incontinence where the bladder is no longer under executive control. Um, all subtypes, they note, uh, were, did progress to permanent dysfunction um, without a complete progression, uh, progression to a complete cauda syndrome. Um, Patients who had a suspected or suspicious quadriquina syndrome is at risk of, but does not have sphincter involvement necessarily. Uh, so, uh, treatment of this when you reach the uh, point of suspicious or suspected quadriquina, they they argue can prevent progression to sphincter involvement. Um, patients who had an incomplete quadriquina uh, had worse bladder outcomes, even when the patient remained incomplete at the point of decompression. <coughs> Uh, and incomplete patients who were operated on at 24, 48, for greater than 48 hours had normal bladder function in 89, 79, 44 percent, respectively. So you have a, based on that retrospective review, they found there was worse long term function when you delayed surgery. However, when they went to look at prospective studies on the same, uh, on the same uh, topic, there was no identified difference. Uh, that earlier surgery had a, a change in those numbers. So it was the only thing that they were able to say is that um, there's literature to, that can support early surgery following a retentive uh, CDS, but that study has not been able to determine that earlier decompression led to improved outcomes. Um, and only a few studies have data that's reported within 12 hours of uh, the retentive symptoms coming on. Um, and that means uh, that they argue that it's very, it's just almost impossible to study because nobody's coming in and getting surgery within 12 hours every single time. You don't have numbers to be able to prove anything. Um, so their, their final thoughts are that the current literature can really only say that we don't know if there's a benefit from early decompression, but that we should. And they leave a table, in table two here. That is this it? What's that? Is this the table? Uh, no, that was just the, okay. the table two is their suspect, their proposed management uh, algorithm uh, for these patients based on these four subtypes that they... Uh, Tell us what it is. So basically, uh, if they have no large central uh, obstructive uh, uh, you know, disc, is, they're, they're specifically saying large central prolapse disc, but anything in the canal that's large and compressive, uh, that you should get them analgesia, reassurance, and send them home with no color chronic depression. They have a large central disc with unilateral radiculopathy. They're at low risk, so standard management of unilateral radiculopathy and avoiding of red flag signs. If they have a large central disc and bilateral radiculopathy, which would put them into the CES suspicious category, then you should admit them. You should give them a uh, neurological observation, lower limb Asia charts, and then um, you can 
operate or watch and wait. Uh, if you operate, you do it not emergently, but you do it somewhat urgently. Uh, and if uh, it deteriorates, then you do it emergently. Um, if they have a large central disk uh, and they have an incomplete product line, then you operate emergently because that will progress to the uh, you know, sphincter involvement. Uh, if they have a large central disk uh, of an uncertain, whether it's incomplete or retentive, or it's early, uh, retentive up to 12 hours, um, then they want you to do surgery uh, as soon as reasonably possible, but it doesn't need to be in the emergency setting. It can be in the morning. And so that was their sort of final hour. Okay, very good. So, um, so at risk is bilateral radiculopathy. Incomplete is the bladder is not normal, but not totally out. Uh, retention and then complete neurological. I won't get into this, but this is another. Uh, I didn't give this to you guys. I forgot to give it to you. But it's a 2014 study. Very similar is um, th th there's a pattern how these people present. They start on the left with bilateral sciatica, and then they get some paresthesias. They get some motor deficits, and then they usually get perineal anesthesia. And then next is the bladder, next is the bowel, and next is complete uh, bowel. So it goes in steps, and basically you want to catch it as early as you can. So bilateral sciatica in a large disc herniation is very suspicious. Okay, who has timing of uh, Megan? Okay. Um, so this is a study uh, that looked over 20,000 patients uh, retrospectively from the nationwide inpatient sample database, which is an uh, all-payer database for the U.S., um, and their question was looking at timing from presentation, mean when they presented to the hospital or their clinic rather than the, the time of symptom onset uh, to the uh, time of surgery. They used day zero and one as one category versus day two or later. They couldn't use hours um, just for the fact that there's a retrospective and they were looking at from admission until surgery and um, so they couldn't quantify hours. 66% of patients had an ETL due to herniated disc um, causing the chronic point syndrome. Um, and they actually found that the delayed intervention, meaning two days or later, um, was associated with a statistically significant um, inpatient mortality rate. It's a wrong second. These are, this is 20,000 patients they studied. Correct. Kind of Over 20,000. Yeah, it's a huge study. Okay, Correct. keep it's going. It's the largest Sorry. study, but again, retrospective through chart mm -hmm. review. Yeah. Um, uh, and so they found the inpatient mortality was higher, there were higher complications rates, there were higher non-routine discharges um, uh, that was statistically significant. And then there's trends towards increased fully catheterization, longer length of stay, higher costs, um, and a higher rate to dis a discharge from another facility. They also find that since this was between 2000 and 2014 at the timing to surgical intervention, uh, for chronic coin, it really hadn't changed much between 2000 and 2014. So despite all this literature, um, it really hasn't changed much. And so all of these findings have are uh, very consistent with the other studies, just like the one we just presented by um, Han that looked at the meta-analysis that showed better recovery to motor sensor, bladder, and rectal function prior to 48 hours. Um, but that study analysis also looked at uh, the sub-24 hours and sub-48 hours, and that was no difference. As well as a previous study by Thacker, which also looked at this national um, nationwide inpatient sample database, but that was only 4,000 patients, so this was basically a follow-up study of that. And that also showed that delayed intervention beyond the 48 hours was associated with poor inpatient outcomes for both complete and incomplete Cotaquina syndrome with incomplete benefiting more from early intervention. And again, in that study, the sub-24 hour had no benefit for the um, kind of long-term patient outcomes, but they did show that there was a benefit for, to reduce DVT, embolism, acute renal failure in those patients. Um, and that study also showed traumatic etiology did not show any difference in outcomes with the timing. So if you had a tra traumatic uh, product quinus syndrome, it didn't matter what, what time it was either before or after 48 hours. I thought this was interesting that Dr. Dry said that the legal issue is um, based on the time of symptom onset, when I feel like all of this literature is based on time of presentation to a, like a hospital. So I'm surprised that uh, lawyers can use the time of symptom onset and not necessarily kind of presentation to the hospital, which is drastically different. 
and showing presentation at the hospital is 48 hours. That's interesting. And that was also with her study as well. So um, I don't really see how they can use that in the legal realm. That's interesting. That's interesting. All right, I want to get this. This last study is the most important one, I think. So I'm going to get to it. Good job, um, Megan. So bladder scans and post-void residual volume measurements for <laughs> diagnostic accuracy of cauto syndrome. So this was in Spine 2019 out of the UK. Um, some of the justification the authors used to use you know, bladder control is that um, given the daily frequency of urination, the function of the bladder gives a pretty useful assessment of cauto integrity with you know, loss of executive control of the bladder with retention or overflow incontinence, like we mentioned, being a um, pretty good um, demonstrable endpoint for compromise of the catacrona nerves themselves. And so this was a prospective observational cohort study. Um, they enrolled 92 patients from 2015 to 2016 over a six-month period, uh, the mean age being 44.9 years and 52% um, being women. And so they included patients uh, referred to their center uh, with suspected catacrona syndrome on clinical grounds alone. Um, and then these patients would require MRI, MRI evaluation before intervention if um, that was appropriate. And so they excluded patients who were referred to their center um, with MRI scan already confirming a large um, disc herniation and, or prolapse uh, with uh, catoquinic compression. Um, and so bladder scans, uh, both pre and post void bladder, bladder scans were performed as a part of their initial clinical assessment on admission. And only patients with complete data sets of bladder scans, MRIs, and documented outcomes were uh, included in their study themselves. And so um, a total of 17 out of the 92 patients, or about 18%, had a positive MRI scan, uh, so meaning they had a prolapsed disc occupying the canal and compressing on the catoquina nerves. Um, all these patients underwent surgical intervention in the form of discectomy and decompression. Uh, they also looked at other um, physical exam signs like anal tone and perianal numbness uh, and tried to see, you know, what the sensitivity of those were in terms of um, predicting uh, the need for surgery later on. And so the sensitivity of anal tone to predict catoclonic syndrome uh, was 52.9% in this series. Um, and then perianal numbness, either unilateral or bilateral, uh, had a sensitivity of 82.3% and a negative predictive value of 92% in their series. Um, so in terms of the bladder control or the post void volume, for the group without CES, the mean post volume was um, 199 milliliters. Um, and so they kind of used this as the optimal cutoff for the post void scan, uh, showing that patients who had a post void residual volume of greater than 200 milliliters actually had a odds ratio of 20.7. So they're 20.7 times high, like uh, their odds of having catoquina syndrome if they had post void residual volume of greater than 200 was. 20.7 times higher than if they didn't have um, a post void volume of greater than 200. So you should repeat that. That's just, I mean, that's incredible yeah. study, right? Repeat what you just said. So, uh, so, so let's odds, say you had to say it to somebody who's a medical student, and they say, I think this patient may have a quadriquina syndrome in the emergency room. Is there a way that I can figure it out? What would you tell them? So if they have a, if you get a bladder scan after they void it, and if it was above 200 milliliters, they were they are 20.7 times more likely to have catoquina syndrome than someone who had a post-void volume of less, less than 100. So extremely high risk, yeah. 20 times. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. It's yeah. so like I think everybody needs a bladder scan. I think if you're not if you're considering not going to surgery or to prove that you need to go to surgery. Correct. Yeah, because at the very least, you know, the, when they ended up doing the sensitivities and specificities, so they had a 94. It was 94 percent in terms of sensitivity, 72 specificity, and then a negative predictive value of 98 percent. So if you have um, a scan, a post void scan, less than 200 cc's, then the negative predictive value is 98 percent, which is pretty pretty it's a good positive. test. Yeah. This is such a you know. And a valid and useful tool because it's something where we should talk to the ER about not putting a Foley in until we've been able to evaluate the patient. Um, you should get this test, yeah. I mean, they usually don't put a Foley in, but yeah. This I test is important. They, they often will have put the Foley in if the patient is complaining that there is some urinary. Yeah, system. then you can't do the test. You have to wait eight hours for the test. You right. have to pull the Foley and wait till the bladder yeah. reaccumulates. Why don't you, uh, you get that article printed out? And the, uh, ER. <laughs> yeah, she said yeah, the email, forward it. We have it in the email. I sent the email to, to everybody. So yeah. forward it to the chief of the ER and say right. this is important. Post for residual. It's an easy, it's an easy test. And they have it in the ER and the floor. So it's like a no-brainer in my so mind. Cheap. Yeah, it's cheap. Everybody should get one. 
It's a great. You don't need to call back in to do it. No, it's a great <laughs> test. It's a great article. I thought it was interesting that it had a higher sensitivity, specificity, and predictive value when compared to perineal numbness. And we spent a lot of time t- talking about that. Perineal numbness, yeah. near, perineal numbness is the best thing we got. This is even better. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Any other comments for that? I thought that was, I learned a lot from that. That's going to change our practice. Okay, so this lady, just to wrap up because we're out of time. This lady went to surgery. I mean, she's two weeks now. I took her the next day. I took it, took it out. It was a huge disc. She had an eight-inch area that was numb. The whole perineum was numb. The next day, the numbness was gone, and uh, she had totally normal function. I didn't, I mean... I didn't ask her about her sexual function, but she had no perineal anesthesia, no loss of bowel bowel control. It was a complete home run, Um, like all my cases are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the question. Um, I I just took half the lamina, and I thought that gave me plenty of room to pull the whole thing out. And I go across, I go across the canal. Thanks for coming. um, I'll go across the spinal canal. All right, any other questions? Yeah, Jim? After routine spinal surgery, you're going to talk about quarterfinal right now. How long are you doing your folding? And everything comes out the next day. The other thing we didn't talk about is you can get quadriquinus syndrome from post-op hematoma, and you can get quadriquinus syndrome from uh, myelo, myelo, um, myelocele, uh, I mean meningocele. So you have a CSF leak. That can push on the thecal sac real bad, and it can happen like post-op day five. And you have hematoma. That could happen post-op day two and three. So those are serious. Those are real things that could happen too. We didn't talk about it. I asked because the one paper that kind of said post surgery you can have these things. They're very rare. rare yeah. You have them, but you have a foley in. Having a foley in, you have a way to assess there. A lot of people attribute it to just normal post operative pain. Right? Yeah, it's hard to assess. Well, it's hard to assess. <clears throat> so, likewise, the post operative residual table being so good. And my thought is maybe foley comes out as soon as they get off the OR table. And if they'll use a bedpan because they just can't get to the mode, that's better to be able to find a patient that might have this as opposed to just leaving the folding for a convenience factor. Uh, maybe it's an issue. I don't know if we should change policy. I know it's a common one day post. I mean, it's, it's probably after 24 hours that you're going to present. So I think it's fully out the next day.